happens is once you get beyond a fairly small number of people, um, you start to get problems of, for example, waste buildup, you get problems of clean water supply and so forth. Now, these pictures are pictures of an informal settlement um, in Kenya, in um, a place called Kibera, which is part of the city of Nairobi. It's an informal settlement, or um, in South America, you might call it a favela. Um, and the challenge that you can see there is that once you get a certain number of people living in the same place, then managing your waste becomes a real problem. And you end up with things like open sewers running down the middle of streets, not very pleasant. Um, the picture on the bottom left there is actually of a school and the door of the school opens right out effectively into that open sewer. That's not a healthy place to be. It's not a particularly pleasant place to be. It's certainly not a place that you would want to go to school in or have, you know, you wouldn't want to have that outside the front door of your school, I'm sure. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to send my kids there. Um, but it, unfortunately, it's the reality of a lot of places in the world, particularly settlements that have grown up informally. On the other hand, a place that has very good infrastructure that's been developed over several hundred years might be represented by this picture of New York. You've got um, nicely managed streets, you've got power to the city, you've got clean water being provided into taps, um, the, there's recreational space there, there's a nice clean pond or lake in the middle of that recreational space, um, there's a public transport system. That's clearly a place that's got very good infrastructure and as a result of that, it's a nice place to live, it's got great museums, it offers lots of good jobs, you can get from your home to your job relatively easily, either on public transport or in your own car. Um, it's a much healthier, more vibrant place to live, a much pleasanter place in lots of ways than the image of Kibera that I showed you before. But having good infrastructure doesn't necessarily mean you live somewhere like New York. What it means is you have, it, the infrastructure is contributing to a healthier lifestyle. So the next picture I want to show you is actually of a refugee camp. So this is a refugee camp in Jordan. It holds uh, a lot of the people um, who fled the fighting in Syria live there. Um, as you can see, it's not kind of all shiny and exciting like New York looks. However, it's well structured, it's clean. You can see that there are power lines. You can see that there are water towers. You can see that people kind of look clean. It's a well-managed environment. So although the people living there have been through an awful lot of trauma, they fled a war, they are now living in a place which enables them to start to put their life back together. They're not having to cope with what many refugees have to cope with, which is again, a sort of informal settlements, even more informal than Kibera, because that's been there for many decades now. So it's kind of, it's informality is developing a formality. Um, so these two pictures are very different examples of good infrastructure, but nonetheless, they're both examples of good infrastructure. So I just want you to hold that in your mind as I go through this talk today. Um, <clears throat> the other important thing about infrastructure is it helps us meet the sustainable development goals. Now I'm sure you're all very aware of these. The ones I've highlighted in red here, are the ones that are clearly directly affected by the infrastructure systems I was just talking about. So clean water and sanitation relies on our water supply and our sewer networks. Affordable and clean energy re relies on us having good energy systems, either at a national scale or at a local scale. Um, our industry and innovation relies on having good in infrastructure because you need power for industry, you need transport to get goods to and from your factories and so on. And finally, sustainable cities and communities really rely on having good infrastructure so that we have healthy, vibrant places to live that people want to live in that they're not getting sick in. But in addition to that, good infrastructure also contributes to the ones I've highlighted in blue here. So good infrastructure helps to combat poverty. You've got good infrastructure, you've got good transport infrastructure. It's much easier to access education and a job, for example. It contributes to good health and well-being. When Sir Joseph Bazalgette built the um, sewer system in London back in the 1860s and 70s, he was doing that in response to both the fact that the River Thames really smelt, which is why the politicians in Westminster cared about it all of a sudden, but actually what it did was it produced the biggest public health initiative in UK history um, and addressed a massive cholera epidemic as well because the water supply system in London was being polluted by sewage. So huge public health impact of an infrastructure um, project. Um, decent work and economic growth, again, rely on good infrastructure, because without good infrastructure, your industries can't function, your social infrastructure can't function. Um, this also helps to uh, reduce inequalities. Um, there are two kind of flip sides, though, which is that if we're not responsible about the way that we create our infrastructure, then we can have a negative um, impact on sustainable development goals 12 and 13. So if we've got good infrastructure, then we can be um, sustainable and responsible about our consumption. For example, we can use public transport instead of driving private cars. Um, but the flip side of that is if we do it wrong, then we end up with infrastructure that uses a lot more carbon, it uses a lot more resources, it's not as responsible. 
And likewise, with um, climate action, our, our, our infrastructure can either contribute to solving the climate crisis or it can contribute to creating more of a climate crisis. So we have to be careful when we're, when we're thinking about and designing infrastructure. Um, but if we get it right, and this yellow document here is something I contributed to a while back, this is a document about a vision for the built environment, um, which was subscribed to and, and contributed to by a whole range of the professional engineering institutions. So the Institution of Structural Engineers, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, the Institution of Civil Engineers, which is my own institution, um, the Royal Institution of, of um, Chartered Surveyors, REBA, and lots of industry partners all contributed to this. And basically what we were trying to say was our vision is for a built environment whose explicit purpose is to enable people and nature to flourish together for generations. Now, that's a bit like the Brundtland definition of sustainability, for those of you that know it. But essentially what we were saying as, as a group of industry bodies and academic bodies was it's important to think about our infrastructure, not just as a series of projects of big shiny things like High Speed 2 that some of you will have heard of or Thames Tideway, the big super sewer that's being built in London, but actually to think about it as a system that helps humanity to flourish. So I'm now going to talk about infrastructure as a system of systems and explain what I mean by that. So I've talked about all those different kinds of infrastructure that we have that contribute to our, our cities and our, um, our towns and our villages. But it's made up of a whole bunch of different systems, as I said. So we have the transport system, we have the energy system, we have the telecom system, we have the water system, we have the waste system, we have the social infrastructure system that I talked about. Um, we have our residential, commercial and industrial buildings, so the places where we live and work. Um, and then we have that interface with the natural environment, which is both around our cities and towns, but also within our cities and towns. You know, we, we mustn't forget that we're part of that natural environment, even if we've done things to it by building stuff. Um, and all of that comes together to make this system of systems. And all of those systems rely on each other very heavily. So the power system relies on the ICT system and the water cooling system. The water system relies on energy and ICT usually. Um, our waste systems rely on power um, and often on the water system to be functioning well. So, so all of these um, infrastructure systems are, are sort of woven into each other very heavily. So it's a very complex thing, this infrastructure system and systems that includes the buildings, the water, the transport and so on. And this diagram is trying to show not just that, but the fact that um, so the industry that I'm part of, the infrastructure industry, I'm a civil engineer. Um, we often think in terms of new projects. So the new projects bit of this, if you can see my mouse, is, is this bit here. So, so that most of the industry is really focused on planning and designing and building and commissioning big new shiny things like High Speed 2 or the Shard as a building in London and, and so on. But actually what's often forgotten is that once you've built those things, they are in use and they remain in use for many decades and even centuries to come. Um, so they interact with and support each other, as I said, and they effectively, they've been built over 200 or more years. You know, Basil Jett built his sewage system in the 1860s and 70s. We're still using the system that he built. Um, so they've been put together over 200 or more years and they have to effectively be maintained indefinitely. And that's the role of a civil engineer. And each year we only add about 0.5% by value to this complex system of systems. So all those big new shiny things we build, even something as massive and expensive as High Speed 2, is only a tiny, tiny fraction of what we have around us already. And you can tell that by looking out of the window of wherever you're sitting right now. If I look out of the window, I can see lots and lots of existing buildings and one new building being built. I'm sure it's the same for most of you, if you can see any new buildings at all. So a key thing that we have to remember about our infrastructure is it's vital in sustaining us in our communities. And as Maria said, if you've had a power cut or you've had your water cut off or you've had your phone lines down over the last couple of weeks with our big name storms coming through, you'll understand that all the better. Um, the other thing to remember, though, is that infrastructure isn't just a system of systems, it's also a system of services. So it provides social, economic and environmental outcomes to us as people, um, to our families, to our um, communities and to the nature around us. So it can have a positive or negative impact on nature around us as well. Um, and all of that helps support our domestic lives, our, our business lives, our work lives, our school lives, and what we do for fun. So that's sort of infrastructure as a, as a lump of physical stuff. But increasingly, with the advent of the Internet of Things, the Internet itself, sensing systems, you know, everything we've got in our mobile phones and everything else around us, 
we've got the opportunity to create a cyber physical system. And what I mean by a cyber physical system is a system where we have data that interacts with the physical stuff. So we have a digital twin of the physical object. And this has been done uh, to, to great effect in things like the aer aerospace industry. So you may know about Rolls-Royce who designed the, the, a lot of the big aero engines that hang up our jumbo jets. They have an amazing digital twin of their jumbo jets where they know exactly how they're performing at all times, wherever they are in the world. And they know exactly when those digital twins are going to, sorry, when those physical twins, when the actual engines are going to need to be maintained. And they can do minor maintenance or major overhauls exactly when required. We don't quite have that about our physical built environment yet, but we're working on it. Um, and we're working on developing these digital twins. And what's crucial about this is you have the physical object and you have the digital twin of it. And the digital twin isn't just a model. What it is, is it, it is a model, but it's a model that receives data from the physical object and then enables the people who need to make decisions about that physical object to analyze the data, review it and make decisions, which then allow us to make interventions on the physical twin. So I'm going to talk a bit later on about some work we've been doing monitoring bridges, for example, understanding what condition they're in. So we have a physical bridge, we have sensors on it with a pro producing data, and that helps us understand the condition that the bridge is in and decide when we need to go and maintain it, for example. So when you've got a 200 year old system of systems that you've got very little historical information about often, it's very important to start to think about how can we use these digital tools to help us better understand these very valuable physical assets that we have and then intervene on them to keep them going. Um, and that has implications, not just for the services that they can provide, but also, for example, for the carbon footprint. And I'll touch on that at the end of my talk. And by doing all of this, we get what I call smart infrastructure. So I'm from the Centre for Smart Infrastructure and Construction, as Maria said, or we call it CSIC. And smart infrastructure sounds like a very fancy term, or isn't it terribly complicated? Well, it can be, but really the concept is very simple. And it's just what you get when you put the physical and the digital together to create these cyber physical systems. Um, and civil engineers, which is what I'm one of, um, have a responsibility for designing, building, operating, managing and integrating our infrastructure and built assets in perpetuity. So this is a picture of Liverpool, which I chose because it shows all kinds of things. It shows some very old buildings in the foreground here. It shows some very new shiny buildings. It shows some communications buildings. It shows some energy infrastructure. Um, there's a port down here. You can't see the water infrastructure because it's usually buried. But you can see in that that this sort of mesh of our, of our physical environment all woven together um, is vital to creating a vital place, you know, a fun place to be, um, but a place that's also healthy and, and happy um, and an enjoyable place to live and spend time. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time now on these cyber physical systems and digital twins, just to give you a sense of, of what they're about and how we use them in civil engineering. Um, so as I said, a, a digital twin is just the physical twin of, sorry, a digital twin is the digital sort of avatar, if you like, of a physical thing. Um, and they're connected together by data in one direction and decisions or interventions in the other direction. Um, so you can have a digital twin of a single object, like a train. Um, you can have a digital twin of, sorry, my mouse is a bit lively, of a whole transport system. Um, so you can have a digital twin of a train, of a railway, and then of your entire transport system put together. And then you can actually bring your transport system digital twin together with your power system digital twin together with your water system digital twin, et cetera, et cetera. So, we end up with this ecosystem of connected digital twins. So you might hear people talking about a national digital twin. And if you do, what you've got to remember is it's not one single thing. It's actually lots of things which are connected together and they're exchanging data between them, as you can see by these sort of ones and zeros that we've got on the diagram here. Um, that said, there is an aspiration to have a national digital twin in the UK. And the reason for that is that um, it's not good enough just to know how one train is, is behaving and what condition it's in. You need to know the condition of the rails it's running on. If you've got a problem with your rail network, you need to know that your road transport network can, can fill the gap. So, you know, those of us who travel on trains regularly are used to the jolly old bus replacement service that often runs on a Saturday or a Sunday. Um, but we can only have that bus re replacement service because we've got this integrated system of transport. Um, likewise, we need to know if we're running a hospital that the power system will stay live, that the water provision will be there. Um, and if, if not, we have to have emergency systems to back those up. Um, and to really understand how all that works, um, it's helpful to have this national scale view. But the national scale view is at a much less detailed level than the individual information, for example, about a train or a building or a rail. Um, and 
some colleagues also in Cambridge at the Centre for Digital Built Britain worked with a wide group of people from industry and academia to develop these, this set of values that we call the Gemini principles for digital twins. And I wanted to show this to you because what's important to remember is that these digital twins aren't just bits of tech for fun. They aren't just toys. Actually, they're there to provide a useful and a valuable purpose, um, to connect data together and to enable decision making. So we created these Gemini principles to make it clear that a digital twin must have a clear purpose. And if it's a digital twin of something in the public um, realm, like infrastructure, then it must be used for the public good. And it must create value and enable insights to so enable decisions to be made. So that's number one, you must have a purpose for your digital twin. Number two is it must be trustworthy. And this is a tricky one because it must be secure. Now, often when people think about secure data systems, they think about systems that can't be accessed by anybody outside of a very small community. Um, systems that are sort of wrapped around with lots and lots of layers of security. But on the other hand, because this is about infrastructure, which is providing a public service and that we need to connect together, actually these systems also need to be as open as possible. So they're not completely open. We would obviously never have all the data about one of our power plants or one of our water treatment systems out there in the internet for anybody to, to access. But we must be able to share them between water companies or between the water and the power company. Or you know, if there's going to be some kind of issue you need to be able to share data perhaps between some of the infrastructure companies and the government and so on. And the other critical thing is that they must be built on data of an appropriate quality. And appropriate is a tricky word here, but um, as you will all know from your physics and chemistry lessons, um, data is not an exact thing. So if you're running an experiment, you will collect data and it's very rare that your data will lie on an exact straight line, for example. It will, it will be distributed around the line and that's called the error bars or the quality of the data. Now, it's fine to have data that is of very high accuracy or in fact, less high accuracy, as long as you know the accuracy of your data, you know the quality of it, you know how recently it was collected, you know what it was collected for, um, you know what tools were used to collect it, you know what the accuracy of those tools was. Um, with all of that, you can then make informed decisions about first off, whether you can trust the data and second off, whether you can use it for the kinds of decisions that you need to make. Um, and sometimes inaccurate but plentiful data, for example, crowdsource data, can give you an awful lot of information, um, even if it's not you know, measured to the, to the nearest point, not one of a millimeter or something. The last thing is that um, these digital twins must function, so you must be able to connect them together um, so that they can exchange data and information. Um, you must have clear ownership and governance of them, so you have to curate your data, you have to look after your data, um, and make sure that, you know, that links very much to the quality piece. You have to make sure that um, the, that someone or some organization is responsible for the data, for making sure that it's up to date, for making sure that it's accurate and so on and so forth. And lastly, because this is all about technology and we all know technology evolves very fast, our digital twins must be able to evolve as technology changes. And that's a tricky concept for a civil engineer, because as I said, we build stuff that lasts for 200 or more years. So there's a, there's a sort of a bit of a disconnect in the world of civil engineering between the, the kinds of decisions we have to make to build a bridge or a tunnel or a building that's gonna stand for more than hundred years, it's gonna outlive us. And then embedding in that technologies, which may be, need to be replaced in two or three years time. Um, and that's part of the reason why a center like mine is needed because for our industry, um, we need to really convince our, industry bodies that actually we can do this. We can use this technology, which moves at such a fast rate to give us really useful information about our big lumps of physical infrastructure, which change very, very slowly over time. So how do we use that data then? <clears throat> Some insights from data around smart infrastructure. So one of the things is we have to think about that whole life. Excuse me, I'm just gonna have a quick sip. So we need to think about how long will this asset be used for? If it's a bridge, chances are it will never get taken down unless there's something wrong with it. If it's a building, then it depends on the kind of building. Some of you may well live in houses that are you know, 200 years old. Some of you may live in houses or apartments that are only a few years old. Um, office buildings are one of the things that have the shortest life. Houses obviously live, we use for a long time. Office buildings often get taken down. Um, and one of the issues is that they, they get built with a, a design life. We talk about design life in civil engineering. So a design life of 60 years, let's say, but quite often these buildings get taken down after 20 years. So those of you who live in and near Cambridge 
perhaps will be familiar with Station Road leading up to the station. Um, there are a whole bunch of office buildings down one side of Station Road, um, most of which are new, but they've replaced perfectly good, as far as I could see, office buildings that were only built 20 or 30 years ago. Um, now, for me, that's a waste of resources. But if when people were building those buildings, they assumed that they were only going to be used for 20 or 30 years, they might have made different decisions about how they design them and the kinds of information they need than they would do if they think they're building a building for 60 years or 100 years. And that affects things like the embodied carbon. So the amount of carbon that it's taken to make the materials that, that um, we use in a building or in a, in a bridge or what have you. Um, the other thing we need to think of is, can we make the use of this asset more energy efficient? And quite often that happens at the design stage. So when we're thinking about the design of a building or an energy system or a water system or a transport system, we need to think about the energy efficiency of it right up front at the design stage. When we're looking after a transport system that's 200 years old, we need to think about how can we retrofit things to this transport system or how can we retrofit things to these buildings to make them more energy efficient now? So how can we use new technology on old things to make them work better? And then lastly, how can we make these things easier to maintain? And again, that has an impact on carbon, it has an impact on cost, and it has an impact on resource efficiency. So if we make something easy to maintain, then we can swap things out. Um, a little bit like there's now a, um, a pressure in the, in the white goods industry, so things like washing machines. When I was a kid a million years ago, um, you got your washing machine repaired and you expected it to last you 20 or more years. The last washing machine I bought about seven years ago replaced a washing machine that was only about seven years old. It wasn't worth me getting it repaired because it costs so much to get it repaired and it wasn't designed to be repaired. But now all these manufacturers are coming back to thinking about actually, we need to design things so they can be repaired or upgraded because that's a better use of our planet's resources. And you know, the more people we have, the more strain there is on the planet's resources. So the better custodians we need to be of those things. So in CSIC, we talk about using sensor systems and the data that they generate to help us with designing our infrastructure systems, transforming the way that we build them, changing and improving the way that we manage and operate them, and then helping us think about what we need in our cities. So how do we create smart cities and smart city systems? Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about various aspects of those, but the key thing with smart infrastructure, as far as I'm concerned, it's not just about data, it's about learning from real performance to change the way that we do these things. So we measure real assets, we understand their real performance. Um, in doing all of that, we can then start to reduce uncertainty because we can understand where the uncertainties are and manage them better. And sometimes we can reduce and even occasionally get rid of uncertainties. Um, and we can do things based on the need for them rather than on you know, perhaps a time cycle. And I'll come on to that a bit later. Um, we can also look at creating infrastructure solutions that help our cities be more resilient. And importantly, we can look at the challenges that I've mentioned a few times of resource scarcity, carbon, and resilient infrastructure. So infrastructure that can withstand issues like climate change, um, flooding, and so forth. There are lots of places we can get data from. So the kinds of data that engineers and often physicists are most useful, used to often are these attached and embedded sensing systems that I'm talking about down on the left-hand side here. So these are things that you can actually physically stick to a building, um, put in a room that might include a temperature sensor, it might include a strain gauge, um, it might include a pressure sensor. We use um, fiber optics, which um, you'll be familiar with perhaps from ICT, but we use them as strain gauges. So you can um, attach them to a building and use the changes in the frequency of the light to tell you if there are movements um, and, and strains in that, in that fiber. Um, there's also remote sensing, which again, you've probably heard of. So you've got satellites, you've got drones, you've got vehicle mounted sensors, laser scanning, photogrammetry, which is the use of images and video to, to, to capture changes in things. So, so it's called remote sensing because it's not physically attached, but it can be fairly close and remote, like a, a car, or a, um, you know, one, one of Google's cars scanning a bridge, for example, or it can be very, very remote like a satellite. Um, then we've got material flows and process data. So you know, the kinds of things that you might monitor in a factory or on a railway, how much, how much stuff have I got? When do I need to use it next? What's the power consumption and so on and so forth. And then there's all the other stuff, which I've called social media and other data. And actually, we can get an awful lot of really helpful data about our infrastructure from things like geotagged social media, from ticketing information, from Wi-Fi, um, from GPS and so on. And what that can tell us is what the need is for our infrastructure, 
um, and where we have greater need, for example, or what the loading is on our infrastructure so that we can understand which roads get most use and therefore which roads might need resurfacing more often or um, which bridges on a railway system have the heaviest trains going over them or um, where, our sewers, where our sewers or our water pipes are in danger of leaking and so on and so forth. The challenge though is using data well. So we can get better data from all these modern sensing systems, um, but one of the things about the infrastructure industry is that it, because it's so old, it traditionally gathered a lot of data, but it did it on paper. Um, I remember hearing a, a great story once about um, Isambard Kingdom Brunel, and he wanted to convince um, some investors that his railway gauge was the best one. And he basically set up some kind of accelerometer on the back of a train and produced a readout on paper that was miles and miles long and took this to the investor and said, look, look, my numbers are better, my numbers are better. Um, now that's not a very helpful way of managing data. Paper-based systems aren't great, but they're what we've traditionally had over time. As a result of that, as an industry, the civil, the, 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 the sort of the civil engineering industry has a habit of looking at data once when it's created and then not coming back to it and looking at it again. Now, I hope that this is something that you would never ever think of, of doing. Um, I hope that you guys would think about data and information as something that has a long life and that can be used over and over again. But when you're dealing with people who are you know, even older than me in my industry, that's not a, a situation they grew up with. So we don't always get the most out of the data that we have around us. If we use it right though, and if we manage it well, then we can do fantastic things with it. We can really bring the whole power of big data and artificial intelligence to understanding our infrastructure. We can use optimization algorithms and machine learning and all those kinds of things to inform us um, and, and help us to make better decisions about our infrastructure. So the thing I always say to people in industry, which I hope isn't as necessary to say to you, is that curating our data is absolutely critical. We really have to, for every piece of data we collect, we should have a curation plan for it. What are we collecting it for? How are we going to store it? How are we going to access it again? And what might we want to use it for in the future? Because the future is 100 or 200 years long for most of our infrastructure. So some of the things I'm just going to talk you through very quickly are in design, for example, we can use better data to calibrate and validate our design models. Um, some of you might have done some um, experiments in physics where you build a bridge out of balsa wood or what have you and test it to destruction. Well, if you were doing that for real, um, obviously you wouldn't be building a bridge out of balsa wood and you wouldn't be te testing any bridge to destruction. You'd be using models and design codes to work out how strong your bridge needs to be and therefore how much steel and concrete you need to have in it and so on and so forth. But what we want to do is calibrate those models to make them as accurate as possible so that we can use fewer resources, but make them resilient enough to the challenges that they have to face over the whole of that long life that they have. Um, in terms of construction, we can manage our materials and our processes better. Um, we can do things like progress and quality monitoring using videogrammetry and photogrammetry. And then we can reduce waste, we can improve quality, we can improve the delivery. So often you may hear about you know, big engineering projects like Crossrail, the Elizabeth Line, running over. That's because they're very complicated. They're subject to things like the weather. They last over many, many years. So there's a lot of risk involved in doing these projects. But with better data, we can manage that risk and reduce the risk of, of projects running over time or over budget. Then when we've got these things over their very long lifetimes, we can use our data to manage them well over that whole life. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. And then we can think about how our infrastructure meets the needs of our cities and our communities and how our infrastructure connects our cities and our communities as well, because that has a big role to play in things like providing opportunities for people, going back to those sustainable development goals that I mentioned earlier. Um, so just a few pictures of things we've done in CSIC, because it's kind of fun. This is a picture um, down in the Liverpool Street Crossrail Station. So the Elizabeth Line um, Crossrail Station at, um, at Liverpool Street Station. The, um, the lining of this is, so basically the, the main tunnel is bored using a, a, a fantastic machine called a tunnel boring machine. It's essentially a factory with a chewing disc at the front of it that just kind of powers through the clay and the rock. Um, but then when you get to the position of having the station caverns, you have to enlarge that. So that's done by, by manual or machine digging, in the case of this machine digging. But then in order to hold that soil up, you have to spray it. And the technique is called spray concrete lining. It's a very uncertain thing. You basically look wet concrete in a nozzle and you're squirting it um, at the, the walls of the tunnel. And it's because it's such a, an ill understood thing, we've never had the tools before to measure and monitor it. The models for it are very um, conservative. 
So we, we are probably underestimating the strength of the material and therefore overestimating the amount of material that we need. So we had the opportunity to go down into the, the cavern, monitor and um, apply sensing systems to the, the, the steel um, reinforcement bar that you can just about see on this photograph. And then as they were bashing holes, they then sprayed that over and then they, they bashed holes through from the um, adjacent passenger tunnels into the rail tunnel. And we were able to measure and monitor the strains in that um, steel rebar as that was happening. What was great about that was we were able to show, and this is a fairly crude representation of it, but we were able to show that the strains that developed and therefore the stresses that developed in the material were A, much lower than the models were predicting, and also they, they dissipated, they reduced much more quickly from the mouth of this cross passage tunnel that was being pushed through. Um, so that's just a small example of how if we start to calibrate our models, we can end up using less material, we can reduce our carbon footprint, we can reduce our costs, and we can reduce the time it takes to build these things. Um, this is a, a, a related thing from construction. So um, this picture here is a picture of a very beautiful church in London called St Mary Ab Church, and it was designed and built by Sir Christopher Wren back in the, I don't know, 1670s, after the Great Fire of London. It's got these beautiful frescoes painted on the ceiling, and it's a fantastic piece of architecture in the city. Um, however, it's very close to Bank Underground Station, and Bank Underground Station is, um, it has been in the past very congested. So Transport for London decided they wanted to address this and they wanted to do an upgrade to the station. The problem was that this involved tunneling and digging, digging very big holes next to some very beautiful old buildings, including St Mary Ab Church. Um, and the worry with this was that it might cause the building to, um, to subside, basically, because as the tunnel goes through, you, you get um, a, a relaxing of the soil. If the building were to start to subside, then you, you, you run the risk of, of cracking, which runs the risk of some of these beautiful frescoes falling, or worse yet, the building falling down. Now, we didn't think building falling down was very likely, but the frescoes cracking and falling down was, and that would have been a massive um, upset to the owners of the church, but also it would have you know, damaged some of our heritage. So um, we were able to come along and deploy some of our smart sensors, including laser scanning and fiber optics, and monitor the church while the tunneling was happening so that we could tell the, um, the construction company if there was going to be a problem with the church. If we hadn't been able to do this, they would have had to have done a lot of remedial work before they did the construction. And the issue with that is, the best thing to do with a 400 year old church that survived a world war and some bombs and other tunnels being dug under it is as little as possible. So by doing this work, we were able to save the construction company something like two million pounds over the course of the project because they didn't have to do that remedial work because we were able to reassure them and the church owners that actually the, the tunneling they were doing wasn't going to damage the church. Um, we can also use you know, videogrammetry to, to track construction progress and to create um, models of our, of our existing assets, which is really helpful. Um, and we can come along and do similar monitoring to what I was just talking about on the church, but on existing assets. So this is a railway bridge near Leeds, um, it's a viaduct actually, um, and it dates back to the 1850s. Um, it's on the main line into, into Leeds station and it's got a number of fairly hairy looking cracks. Um, and it's clearly a bridge that's in a certain amount of distress because when it rains, you can actually see water seeping out of the cracks as trains go over the bridge. Um, so we came along with a, a range of interesting sensing systems and we were able to understand how the bridge was behaving. Because the problem that the bridge manager had was he didn't know whether, you know, have these cracks been there for 150 or 200 years? Are they still growing? They're clearly sometimes still moving, but are they still growing? I don't know. So he didn't know what to do to both assess whether the bridge was serviceable, how long it was going to be serviceable for, and um, what repairs, if any, he needed to make to it. So we both helped him understand how the bridge was behaving, but then we've also got some of our monitoring systems attached to the bridge long-term so that we can start to look at the deterioration rate of the cracks which are growing, so that he can then make much better decisions about when he needs to intervene on this bridge and do it in a resource efficient and a, and a, and a, um, a, a financially efficient way. I'm going to skip over that. Um, and then we can get to the city scale where we start to think about um, these things, not just at the level of an individual bridge, but for example, a complete highway system. So this is the city of San Francisco where a colleague did some work looking at both how the different roads were constructed and surfaced, but then also how much traffic they saw um, so that they could prioritize 
highway inspections and highway maintenance, um, according to both the importance of the route. So this diagonal road here carries an awful lot of the um, public transport routes in San Francisco. So you don't want that to have great big potholes on that, but you also don't want to have to be digging it up in the middle of the day. So you need to have you know, a highly prioritized approach to how you maintain your road system so that you can keep the traffic moving, but also keep people safe. And we've done a lot of work and it's a whole other lecture to talk about future proofing, but you can use better data about your infrastructure to both understand how it's performing now and how you need it to perform in the future. So if you think about things like climate change, for example, um, you know, how, how do we need our infrastructure to perform in the future? And how well does the current infrastructure or the design that we have potentially perform against that future requirement? And then you can assess where we are against where we need to be and make decisions about actually, do we need to address these gaps or not? Are they things that we must address right now because that's the cheapest and most efficient way to do it? Or is it something we can leave for later, but we need to keep an eye on it and make decisions down the line about changing or intervening on something? So we did some work with, um, a big wastewater treatment plant at Liverpool, where one of the things they were facing was, was climate change and sea level rise, because they're right on the coast. Um, and they were starting to think about, well, how, how future-proof are we against this issue of sea level rise? Which bits of our design have the biggest gaps um, and, and, and need us to address them soonest? And then we move on to smart city systems, where we're thinking about not just the infrastructure, but how we use the land, for example. Where are people going to live? Where are people going to work? Where will we need to put our infrastructure systems? Where do we have space for any of this stuff? And how does all of that interact with our natural environment? Um, I don't have an awful lot of time left, so I would just quickly skip through perhaps this. I'm going to go to carbon because I think it's more important than um, policy. So just coming back to though what we do with better data, um, I think the important thing is that we can use fewer resources if we have better data. We can make sure that our infrastructure continues to produce, provide the important services that we need from it. You know, you're all watching this lecture tonight as a result of some information and, communi uh, and communications technology, as a result of the power system. Um, you may well have gone and made yourself a cup of tea or flushed the loo in between times thanks to the water system and the sewage system. Now, everything that we do depends on our infrastructure. And to keep it operating well, we need to use data and better data in order to understand its condition and maintain it and use it well. So what does all this have to say about carbon? Well, as you all know all too well, we have a climate crisis and we have um, a challenge around the fact that the government has um, set a net zero target for 2050. Um, and that linear reduction to net zero by 2050 isn't gonna be fast enough to, to avoid 1.5 degrees C or more of warming. Our current emissions are exceeding our carbon budget. And the big challenge with that is that once carbon dioxide is up in the atmosphere, it stays there for the next 100 to 200 years. So every tonne of carbon we emit today stays there for another century. So we need to reduce our carbon emissions as fast as we can now. And to do that, we need to not just rely on the hope of future technologies, because the carbon we're emitting now is a problem now and will continue to be a problem. We need to do the best we can with our existing technologies. And that's really important. So we all have a role to play in this. Um, whether you're a sixth form student or like me, an academic at the University of Cambridge, or you know, just a normal person going out there about their daily business. We all have a role to try and reduce our own personal carbon, but also to put pressure on the organizations that we're part of to do as much as they can to reduce carbon as quickly as possible. And most importantly, to make it clear to governments that, 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 that we need government policy to help drive us in this direction. <coughs> And as you will all know, no one is too young or too small to make a difference in that space. Um, the work that Greta Thunberg and her many colleagues around the world, and, and that may well include some of you, um, has been hugely significant in moving government agendas, I think. Um, and it's, you know, those young people have encouraged their parents, their uncles, their aunts, the old people that they know to take action in their own lives as well. Um, and, to, and to make a difference where they can. And, and so we all have a role to play in this. But the role around infrastructure is a very particular one. So, you know, this stuff is beautiful. That is the, um, the Milan Bridge in France, the fourth rail bridge up in Scotland, which is 150 years old, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, and this rather elegant knotty thing on the right-hand side is Spaghetti Junction in Birmingham, which is where the M6 meets 
maybe the M42, can't quite remember. <coughs> it's all great stuff, it's all providing a service, but it's all made largely of carbon and steel. And carbon and steel take an awful lot of carbon to produce. Sorry, it's largely made of cement and steel, and cement and, car uh, and steel take an awful lot of carbon to produce. Um, so that is the problem with our infrastructure. So according to the IPCC, the carbon, uh, our carbon budget um, to get to one and a half degrees C is 400 or 300 gig gigatons of CO2 that we have left. And globally, we emit three gigatons of CO2 a year just from our concrete um, use. So as an industry, the construction industry has um, a massive responsibility to address our own carbon use, our own concrete use. We've got to develop new materials. Absolutely, we have that have lower concrete in them. But we also have to do everything we can right now to reduce the amount of these carbon emitting materials that we need because we have to build schools, we have to build hospitals. And right now we don't have many low carbon materials around us. We certainly don't have them in the volume that we need. So whilst that research is, is, is moving and hopefully moving at pace, we've got to do everything we can to reduce the amount of material that we use, which will stand us in good stead anyway for these novel materials. They'll go further if we use our materials better. So what we have to do as civil engineers is think about first what we build. Now, the first question is, do we have to build anything? And that's a little bit like asking Turkey to vote for Christmas in some ways, because if you're a big contracting company that's you know, building a building and someone says, well, pff, on your next job, when you talk to your client, you need to ask them, do they really need to employ you? It's a bit of a tricky conversation to have, um, but as consulting engineers, we can have those conversations. And as um, academics, we can have those conversations about actually, do we need to build something or have we already got stuff around us? Can we repurpose those buildings on Station Road in Cambridge rather than knocking them down? Can we reclad them? Can we you know, do them up in some way to avoid having to take them down so that we reduce the amount of carbon we put into them and we don't waste the carbon that's already been invested in them? If we do need to build something, do we need to build as much or can we build less? Can we be more efficient in our design of things? Can we create systems um, or, or, or augment existing systems with a smaller amount of materials than, than, than building new would, would, would take. And then finally, what should we build with? So can we use materials with a lower capital carbon, lower embedded carbon? Absolutely we can. We don't have zero carbon materials around us at the moment, but we have more efficient, more carbon efficient materials and we should use those. <coughs> and then finally, we need to optimize our design. So coming back to what I was talking about before about data and so on, we need to optimize our design. We need to optimize our construction processes. We need to reduce construction waste. And we can only do that if we really understand how our assets are performing in use and, what our, and how our processes perform as we're trying to design and build these things. Um, and a much greater person than me, Lord Kelvin, said back in 1883 that if you don't measure it, you can't improve it. So this brings me back to data. Um, and we need to learn from this real performance, as I've been saying. We need to calculate and optimise our designs. We need to calibrate our design models. We need to control our construction processes. We need to monitor and manage our assets. We need to re reduce resource use across the board. And we need to invest in innovation to improve and measure again. So civil engineering is actually where it's at um, in terms of reducing carbon emissions and addressing the carbon challenges. We need to use less resources to look after our infrastructure, we need to make our infrastructure more resource efficient um, and we need to create infrastructure that enables people to live lower carbon, more resource efficient lives. Um, as part of that, I was um, one of the authors of something called the Carbon Reduction Code for the Built Environment. So I don't want to depress you all, I want to reassure you that actually there is stuff happening in this space. Um, so we pulled together an industry group to write this Carbon Reduction Code for the Built Environment to bring the industry together to collaborate and to, importantly to act and make a public commitment to reducing carbon emissions and to report every year on how much carbon emissions they've reduced. So that's one thing that's going on. Um, there's a whole bunch of other industry initiatives. So there's this piece called Engineers Declare, which as you can see from the different languages and locations there is a global initiative, similar to the um, carbon code, but it doesn't have the specific requirements on um, reporting but it does have a lot of really good guidance and the organizations that sign up to it are committing to reducing the carbon in their designs, in their product. <coughs> and then in the UK, a construction leadership council has um, created the Construct Zero initiative again to drive down carbon. The construction industry training board is looking at the skills that we need to get to net zero. There's things like Passive House Trust, which is looking at um, when we build new houses, can we make them zero carbon, extremely energy efficient? 
There's the Enerfit certificate, which is for existing buildings. So that's for retrofitting our homes. Um, and there's the Institution of Civil Engineers, my institution's um, carbon project, which is all about reducing the carbon in civil engineering projects. So there is a lot happening. I'm not saying it doesn't need to happen faster. It absolutely does. And if any of you choose to become civil engineers, you'll be part of this journey to drive our infrastructure forward. Um, so hopefully from that, you've got a sense of why infrastructure matters and what infrastructure is. You've got a sense of the fact that it's a system of systems, you know, all these infrastructure systems are sort of woven together and that they provide the, the services that, that, that keep, you know, life going. Um, you've got an understanding of what we do with digital twins and cyber physical systems and what we can do with data. I didn't do the smart cities bit because I didn't have time, sorry about that. But you've also got a sense of how infrastructure and carbon relate to each other. I think if I leave you with nothing else, I just want to leave you with these two pictures, which is, you know, the value of infrastructure is turning a place that can be very unhealthy and challenging to live in into a place that is much healthier and much more pleasant to live in. And with that, I will close. Thank you very much, Marie. Okay, thank you. Oh, no, that should be working video, but it isn't. I hope, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Um, right. Have you stopped sharing my slides? Oh, no, um, there we go. Stop sharing. Right, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so uh, at this point, we usually get a big wall of applause um, coming at you. And the, the worst thing about Zoom events like this is that doesn't come through live. If you've got any questions arriving, arising from um, Dr. Schooling's work, please can you stick them in the Q&A and then they all end up in one place. And um, then, yeah, so we can, I can feed those in. And um, yeah, okay. So do we have any questions? Usually at this point I have, I have some, but actually I think the way you talk kind of covers things really clearly and it, doesn't spiral me off into questions. It's all very sort of organised, which is good. That may be good, but it's a, it's a shame people don't have questions. I think one of the, the big challenges is that we get taught in silos and we work in silos as professionals. Um, but the reality is that life is much more complicated than that. So what I was trying to convey in this talk was that, you know, we all need to get together and it's a big multidisciplinary world out there. So Whatever you end up doing with your physics A-level, you'll probably be part of this journey in some way, shape or form. That's okay, so we've got question. one question come up. How do you determine how smart or effective a, a system of infrastructure? So ah. is there a way of measuring how smart a city is? <clears throat> so somebody's um, put a question in the chat. Q&A is better, but yeah. how do you measure how smart something is? I will um, endeavour to answer that. So. I skipped over the entire smart cities piece, which is a shame in the light of this question, um, because one of the challenges with technology is people often think about um, technology as the answer, but it's really just a tool. So one of the challenges around the smart city um, initiatives, for example, is that being a smart city is not a destination. Being a smart city is just using data better to help you do whatever it is you're gonna do as a city better. So whether that's provide education, whether that's provide services, um, whether that's to create economic opportunity and so on and so forth. Um, there are a number of indexes, but I'm not sure that they really mean much. Um, we do have, however, a smart infrastructure index, and that looks at how much or how well sort of censored and, and digitalized any given infrastructure organization is. <clears throat> and, and that's done by a survey. And actually, we survey everybody at every level in the organization to ask them. Um, so that's a really interesting um, insight. And I think, you know, we're making progress, but we're definitely not there yet. So there's, there'll be a lot of scope in three or four years time when you guys graduate university to get involved in that. So your background is material science. Are there any zero carbon materials? Not really. One could argue that timber is a zero carbon material. Um, there are new forms of concrete which will be very low carbon and um, one of the problems with portland cement is that you you dig up the lime and then you stick it in a massive kiln um, <clears throat> and that requires uh, in the current status state of things um, an awful lot of um, fossil fuels to, to to execute the process um, but we are definitely leaning in that direction and there are lots of investigations into things like timber 
um, using timber in buildings. And also there's been a massive increase in using recycled steel. So the, the, the carbon footprint of steel is actually coming down quite fast because of recycling steel is, is vastly more energy efficient than um, making virgin steel. Okay, so yeah, somebody else has asked in, in sort of parallel to that, um, what more efficient materials are as good as concrete and it's, yeah, timber if you're lucky. Although Tim, timber is one. Uh, the other thing that's great it, actually yes. is stone. And there was a whole lecture given by someone a couple of years ago on this, um, that actually stone has a very low carbon footprint because it was made in the earth donkey's years ago. And it's actually structurally a very efficient, very efficient material as well. So you don't need too much of it as long as it's in good condition and it's not cracked. Um, there's also um, things like, um, you know, modern materials like composite materials, although they have some issues because obviously they, they do involve polymers and that kind of thing. You can't get away from that entirely, but we can do much better with it. Right. So uh, somebody says, do you think prefabricated infrastructure will be more common to cut down on concrete and other materials being used? Can you make things if you build buildings in factories and then slot them together on site? Is that more efficient? Absolutely. And that's a really brilliant question, Casey. Um, yes, absolutely. So there's a, there's a big move at the moment in buildings to do this because it's a bit easier with buildings because they're kind of smaller and more manageable and they tend to be, you know, shaped around the, the rectangle, <laughs> whereas infrastructure is a bit bendy and, and weird. But um, <clears throat> so there's an awful lot of work been going on in the last three or four years to look at how we do what they call modular buildings or modern methods of construction. Um, and increasingly, we're starting to look at that for... Um, infrastructure. So a lot of bridges have big components that are prefabricated off-site. And if you're doing it off-site, then what you, you can do is you can do it in a much more controlled environment. You know, you can imagine if you're creating a piece of infrastructure in a nicely controlled yard, or better yet, in a factory undercover, um, you can manage the process much better than if you're having to build wooden shuttering and shove um, reinforcement bar in there and then tip concrete on top and it's raining and snowing all around you and so on. So that's a really good point, and it's one that um, you know is is is, grow, is gathering increasing attention in the industry. Um, quite a lot of progress is made. Tunnels have been prefabricated for a long time. So the tunnel boring machine that I mentioned, that kind of chews through the earth, is basically a massive factory, and um, the tunnel segments um, that, that, that the, the, the tunnel is lined with tunnel segments that this massive tunnel boring machine just kind of picks up and pushes against the walls. Um, and in fact, when I was driving down the M11 the other day, I saw a truck with a whole load of tunnel segments on it going somewhere, probably to HS2, I think. Yeah, you, you recognise those things. That's very cool in itself. I have to find pictures. Um, so uh, George has come up with a question comparing um, carbon emissions. Who can have the most impact on carbon emissions? Politicians or and legislators or engineers? Who's going to who's going to? be most useful so ultimately we've all got to push um i think the challenge for politicians is they have a political reality is that they need to get re-elected they also have the challenge that they have an awful lot of things on their plates so you know the last two years everybody in the world has been distracted with covid um so whereas as engineers we can focus pretty much you know our day job is designing and building and managing and looking after assets so it absolutely should be front and centre of our focus every day when we do our jobs we should think what can I do about in, in the designs I'm doing today or the maintenance I'm doing today to reduce my carbon right now and what can I do for the things that I'm going to do tomorrow or next year or in five years time. The important thing about all of us working on it is that it then gives the politicians if you like political cover. It's very difficult as a politician even if you know it's the right thing to do to implement legislation that's going to be hugely unpopular because you don't get voted in next time. But if everybody is saying this is the right thing to do, then you're very likely to do it. Um, so I don't know, I can't, I can't think of a good example of, of something negative, but you know, you wouldn't lift the speed limit um, outside schools to 100 miles an hour because it would be deeply unsafe for kids. You know, nobody would say that was a good idea. If you did it, everybody would say, put in a speed limit outside schools. That's a, you know, we need one. Um, you can think of all sorts of examples of legislation where because because people say it's important, then it gets enacted. Um, so we can have a huge impact. And also the other thing is our clients, our customers, the people who buy our buildings or, or order our infrastructure, they're not experts in this stuff, we are. So we need to 
show them what's in the article possible. We need to challenge them if they're asking for something. Say, did you realise you could do this differently and you could save a whole load of carbon? Um, so it's very much our responsibility, but it is also the responsibility of the politicians because they can create the frameworks that enable all these things to happen. Right. <clears throat> okay. So Emma says, uh, is it is there any way for infrastructure to have no emissions or for a city to have zero emissions? Can we do that? I don't know is the answer to that. Um, I can imagine things, and I'm sure all of you who have much livelier brains than me could imagine all kinds of things. And I think that's what the future relies on. It relies on good scientists and good engineers and good policymakers having the imagination to reach for what seems to be impossible. Um, people occasionally talk about this thing, the moonshot. So when in, back in the early 1960s, President Kennedy realized that America was losing the space race. The Russians had got someone up in space first. And he decided, he was really worried about this for all kinds of reasons. And so he said, by the end of the decade, we are gonna put a man on the moon. That was about seven or eight years away at the time. And they did it from pretty much a standing start. But they didn't do it by sitting around thinking, oh, wouldn't that be a nice thing to do? They did it by bringing together huge numbers, thousands of incredibly intelligent people and getting them to dream big, to think big, to, to work out what it would take to do X, Y, and Z in order to make this, um, to make this happen. And they did it. Um, and if you asked the people in that, if you asked the cleaner in the NASA building, what are you doing? They said, I'm helping put a man on the moon. Because everybody knew that that was the mission of the organization. And we have to turn our engineering profession and our science scientific professions around to think, actually, our mission is about getting to zero carbon. Now, that doesn't mean that a given individual process will necessarily be zero carbon. It needs to be as efficient as it can. But we will be in the future also inventing processes that can capture carbon. We'll be planting trees. We'll be working in, rather than battling against nature, like you might argue that <clears throat> agriculture and engineering and industry have been doing for the last 40 years, we're going to get back to working with nature. OK. Um, so I don't know whether this is a related question or not, but how do you work with other with companies and governments? How do you do your job? How do you advise companies and governments? That's a really good question. Thanks, Sharon. Um, we do a lot of work. So we're very lucky, obviously. If you are part of the University of Cambridge, that comes with a name that people tend to imbue with a certain amount of credibility. Now, whether or not one is credible is a different question, but you know, <clears throat> people listen, which is great. Um, so my centre was set up very much to work with industry. We have about 30 industry partners who are, if you like, at the cutting edge of smart infrastructure and, and all of these challenges around net zero carbon and resilience and so on. Um, and what's great about our centre is we can bring together organisations that would normally be competing for contracts, but when they come together with us, they can have those collaborative conversations. And to move some of these big challenges forward, we need to be collaborating, as well as, you know, a bit of competition is healthy, but for some of these things we need to collaborate. So we bring industry partners together to collaborate on these things. And then um, I showed you a yellow paper way back at the beginning of the talk, um, which was the last in a series of about five papers that we wrote that were all different colours <laughs> that were aimed at policymakers and CEOs and, you know, people in, in, in positions of power to help them understand what the key issues are around infrastructure. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a great opportunity that I have in my job. I mean, I love my job. It's brilliant. I get to do these things. I get to knock around with some fantastically bright and intelligent people who are um, you know, doing brilliant research. And I get to talk to the heads of companies who are trying to push these things into practice and, and do these things for real on the ground. And then we all get to try and influence policy and, and talk to not so much the politicians, but very much the civil servants, occasionally the politicians, but mostly the civil servants to say that this is the way things need to change. We think this is, you know, this is the right way to go. Um, and they listen, which is great. <clears throat> Okay, well, I'm going to go two more questions. I think this one, I think, is a quick one. Um, who creates most digital twins? Is it government and uh, political infrastructure, or is it industrial organisations? It's it's companies largely. Um, sometimes they're companies doing this at the request of, of government. So um, you know, the, the water sector it's a regulated sector, but they're all private companies. So it's essentially private companies. Very very rare that it would be a government um, in in our kind of system that might be different in in different kinds of um government actually so china it might be seen as a government initiative but here it's very much a, a federated set of twins that are owned and managed by different companies okay and um, i'm going to make this the final one um will we reach will the uk reach its net zero target for 20 of by 2030 the target is 2050 
not 2030, although I would quite like it to be 2030, but we have to live in the realms of the politically possible. Um, I think we have a chance. I'm not going to say we absolutely will, but there's a lot of organisations trying to drive as drive down to 80% reductions by 2030, for example. Um, I know that, you know, in Cambridge, in the college that I belong to, Darwin, we've been talking about can we get our energy use down as a college? The university is talking about can it get its energy use down? A lot of the industrial organisations that I work with are all really pushing to try and reduce their carbon emissions as far as they possibly can. And they've got 2030 as their first time horizon, which isn't that long away. Um, and I think if we can keep this collaborative effort going, then we could well reach net zero for 2050. Right. OK, so you've got loads of questions there, some really good ones. So thank you very much um, for that uh, lecture, uh, Dr. Jennifer Schooling. It's been really interesting and thank you very much indeed. OK, I'm going to end this thing now. So Brilliant. thank you very much and thanks for staying on, everyone. It's good to good to talk to you. Maybe we'll get to see each other another time. OK, yeah, Bye. good. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>